Welcome to the preaching ministry of First Cumberland Presbyterian Church of Chattanooga. This recording is simply the sermon portion of our worship service. To experience our full worship service, we encourage you and invite you to join us Sunday morning at 11 in our beautiful sanctuary located at 1505 North Moore Road. We continue this week in the book of Galatians. In some, week, uh, some ways we're doing Paul's greatest hits. Uh, last week it was there's neither slave or free, Jew or Greek, male or female. And this week it is the fruit of the Spirit. So let me share with you from Galatians, the fifth chapter, verses 13 through 26. For you are called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love. Become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger... Quarrels, dissensions, factions, and uh, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. My brothers and sisters, truly this is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, as I was studying this passage this last week and having our day camp in full swing, I'm sure that I just had day camp and vacation Bible school and all the, the ways that, that churches minister to children just kind of on my brain. And so I remembered a story about a church day camp or a church vi vacation Bible school, not this particular church, but from, from some years ago where the little boy comes home from whatever the church event was. And his parents ask him, well, how did it go today? And the little boy bursts into tears and he is just sobbing. And the parents are, are alarmed. What in the world happened? Did he get in a fight? Did he get in trouble? Did, was he bullied? What happened? And, and they're trying to, to get him to speak and he is just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. And finally, he's able to, to, to voice what it is that was so bad, what, what it was that happened. And he said, they told me that, that if I let Jesus come into my heart, that no one will be able to get him out. And so I'm afraid that if I accidentally let Jesus in my heart, he'll be trapped there forever. It's a reminder that children think in very concrete terms. And when we work with children, they need to be aware uh, that we help them understand things in, in a way that they can understand. And yet, thinking about this passage, in which Paul really is talking about what we sometimes call the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, what we really are talking about is allowing Jesus through the Holy Spirit into our hearts, into our lives. Uh, perhaps we as adults ought to take that a little more literally than we do. It's not just that the Spirit is this outside influence, like we have lots of other outside influences, but the Spirit offers to come into our lives and transform us from the inside out. And when the Spirit does that, we are led away from those things that are dangerous for us and that damage the community. Paul says that the ultimate commandment is that we love one another. And we do the, the works of the flesh. We're not loving one another, but we're damaging uh, one another. And when we have the Spirit in us, though, the Spirit leads us away from those things and into those fruit of the Spirit. 
Now you heard the, the translation that I read a few moments ago from the new RSV of the works of the flesh. And some of those words are, are not really uh, words that we use a lot these days. And so let me share with you what uh, Eugene Peterson says, how he translates these in his paraphrase, The Message. Uh, the works of the flesh are repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. Trinket gods. Magic show religion. Paranoid loneliness. Cutthroat competition. All consuming yet never satisfied wants. A brutal temper. An impotence to love or be loved. Divided homes and divided lives. Small-minded and lopsided pursuits. The vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival. Uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions. Ugly parodies of community. And Peterson says, oh, well, you're quoting Paul, and I could go on and on. This isn't an exhaustive list, but it is a, a fairly uh, a long list, of course, of the works of the flesh. And it isn't that once we take the Spirit into our lives, once we allow the Spirit to dwell in us, that we never will engage in those things. We all know that we will in one way or another. But we do have the opportunity, as Paul says, to be led away from them and led instead into the fruit of the Spirit. The way that it was translated earlier is the, the list that we're used to, love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And our lives will display all of those, I would argue, to a greater degree than the others. Again, we don't always get it perfectly. We don't always allow the Spirit to lead us. Uh, but when we do, those things blossom forth from us. It's also the case that those who are not Christian can display those things as well. They are created in the image of God. That, all of that, I would argue, is, is almost a list of what it means to be uh, the image of God. And yet, uh, they too will be led away from those things into the works of the flesh more often than not without the help of the Spirit. And so when we talk about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we're talking about allowing the Spirit into our lives and then allowing the Spirit to do the work for us. The way that the passage was translated a while ago, uh, Paul says, if we live by the Spirit, then let us also be guided by the Spirit. But that's not exactly right. The Greek is actually more encouraging. The Greek is Paul saying to the Galatians, since we live by the Spirit, since you have allowed the Spirit into your life, you now can be guided. You are guided by the Spirit. The idea is that most of the work is done by the Spirit. We simply put ourselves into the Spirit's pathway and the Spirit takes it from there. It's almost like taking a canoe and putting it into a fast-moving stream. Uh, we have to take the canoe and put it there. That's allowing the Spirit into our lives. But once we get into the canoe and into the stream, the stream does most of the work. And that is what Paul is promising us. If I choose to allow the Spirit into my heart, and it's not just a one-time thing, it really is a daily choice. And that's another mistake we make of thinking, well, of course, as that child was told, once the, the Spirit is in your life, once Jesus Christ is in your heart, no one can take it away from you. But it's also the case that we can let it go or we can ignore it. We cannot let it have the influence over our lives that we need to. And so we are encouraged in a daily way to commit ourselves again to the Spirit, allowing the Spirit to let all all of those wonderful things flow out of us. Not simply so that we experience love, joy, peace, patience, and all those things, but so that others experience that in us. And we increase community, and we are able to share the gospel. Lowell Mayen is a rather unlikely person to think that might be able to change the world in some substantive way. And yet, he is doing just that. Lewell was born in the early 90s as his family was fleeing from civil war and tribal warfare in South Sudan in Africa. And they were having to go from place to place, just wherever it might be safe or wherever there might be food. And for three years, his family was simply on, a, on the move after being forced out of their house, out of their home because of the war. And uh, Lewell was born as his family was making their way all around uh, South Sudan 
Eventually, they made their way to a refugee camp in northern Uganda. And this actually was a wonderful place for them. Uh, Lowell says that the refugee camp was a great place to grow up in, partly because it was the only life he had ever known, uh, but mostly because it was a place where he and his family were safe. However, it was a refugee camp. There were shortages of everything. The opportunity to, to make money or to, to be able to have a freedom was fairly limited, not completely limited, but fairly limited. And yet as he grew up there in that camp. When he was 10 years old, he happened to go with his mother to a United Nations a, a aid tent to register for something or apply for something. And the, the UN aid worker was using a laptop computer. Luol had never seen a computer before and he was absolutely enthralled. And as they walked away, he said to his mother, Mom, I would like to have a computer. I want to have a computer like that person had. Well, his mother laughed at him and said, Luol, how could we ever be able to afford a computer? And yet she realized perhaps if she could get him to be able to have a computer, maybe that could be one of the things that could give him a ticket out of that refugee camp. And so she worked very hard. She made uh, elaborate and beautiful bed coverings using a loom, weaving them. And she made them and sold them. And over the course of several years, she was able to save up more than $300. And she bought Luol a used laptop computer. He first got it, he was a young teenager. He was just absolutely thrilled. So thrilled that he had to work pretty hard just to use it because he would have to walk sometimes for hours just to get to a generator where he could plug it in to charge up its battery. Later he discovered the internet and like any teenager was amazed at this whole new world that existed. And he found an internet cafe in the, the nearby village that he could walk to. And again it took a couple of hours to get there and a couple of hours to get back home. But he could walk to the internet cafe and they allowed him to use both their power and their internet for free. And so he, he uh, stayed there as much as he could. Like uh, many teenagers, he quickly discovered video games. And one of the first video games he discovered was Grand Theft Auto. Now, Grand Theft Auto is a very violent video game. And initially, that was very attractive to Lawal. He had lived his whole life in the shadow of violence and heard all the stories about violence. And he knew that he and his family had always been victims of violence. And now in playing this game, he was the powerful one. He was the one able to perpetrate violence on others uh, through the, the game and for a while, it made him feel powerful in a way that he hadn't before. And yet something deep in the wall let him know that this was not right. I wonder if, and I really suspect that, it really was the work of the Holy Spirit on him. He had allowed the Holy Spirit to come into him. And he recognized, as we ought to recognize, that all of the works of the flesh seem to give us power and control. Whether it is sexual conquest or, or causing strife and dissension or, 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 or addiction to, to alcohol or other things. All of those things seem to give us control when in fact we are giving up our control and they take control over us. Luol decided he wasn't going to play violent video games anymore. And he recognized that his mother had sacrificed so hard for him to get that computer that he wanted to use the computer in a way that he could give back to others. And so he began doing online computer programming courses. He wanted to learn just how to program this computer. And he was so good at it that he quickly learned how to program the computer and how to make his own video games. And he was so good, he's able to make a video game that works not only on a laptop computer, but also could work on a cell phone. He had learned his lessons well. And the game he created, he called Salem, which means peace. And he modeled it a little bit after his own life. Uh, in the game, you are a refugee and you have to make your way from a war-torn, violent uh, a place to a place of peace. And along the way, you have to make a number of choices. And if you make choices that make for peace, not only for yourself, but for others, then you're given extended life and you're able to move forward and, and you're given points and you, you move forward in the game. And if you make choices that will end, uh, lead to, to greater violence and more bloodshed or whatever, then you lose points and you're not uh, winning the game. And it's a way to really encourage peace. Luol uh, modeled this really after his own experiences. Even though he and his family were there in a refugee camp, they discovered that the camp was kind of a community, uh, much the way the community that Paul describes in uh, Galatians. It was a community where everyone cared about one another and looked after one another's needs. And if someone needed something and, and someone else had it, they would make sure that they got it. 
Even though money was very scarce in the camp, they were constantly collecting money and also sometimes even collecting grain and sending it back to South Sudan to get uh, those who were there who were unable to make it to the refugee camp and were still stuck in those war-torn areas and were terribly hungry so that they could have food. A wonderful way of people practicing generosity when they didn't have very much themselves. And all of that is a component in that video game. Sure enough, uh, once he was an adult and he spent his first 22 years in that camp, uh, some other video game folk discovered his game and invited him to come to the United States. And now he is actually the president of a game company that he has set up for himself that others helped him. And Salam is still his primary game. And he's found a way to get it back into South Sudan in, in some uh, surreptitious way. Some of those who are, are still engaged in violence and warfare there don't want it there. But he's, get, he's able to to make it free for people back in Sudan to be able to play either on the computer or on a cell phone. And he says this is vitally important because over 73% of the population of that country are under the age of 30. And what is one of the powerful influences on people under the age of 30? Computers and video games, of course. And he says that all of these people, every single one of them, grew up their entire lives under the threat of war and violence. And so this is a way he sees of actually exporting peace almost as a product into this country that needs it so bad. What is truly amazing to me and, and, and what really makes this story just so incredibly beautiful is when an interviewer asked uh, Luol how was it that he himself could turn away from violence and instead begin exporting peace rather than being caught up in the violence and, and perpetuating it more. And his answer was just stunning. He said, there is always that grace God gave us and it is working in us all the time. You hear the fruit of the Spirit, not simply giving the wall peace, but transforming the world, transforming His world, His country through peace. There is a grace that God gave us. It's always there and it is working in us all the time. Beautiful, beautiful reminder. And, and when I recognize that, that, that I am sometimes tempted, not towards the more extreme forms of violence, the more extreme things that, that Paul lists here in that list, but I recognize that sometimes I am tempted to go after those, those works of the flesh in order to feel like I have some control. If Luol could let go of all of those things and instead turn to the fruit of the Spirit, allowing the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in him, the grace of God working in him, then sure Surely I can do the same. Surely you can do the same. Since we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this message from the preaching ministry of First Cumberland Presbyterian Church. Once more, we hope you'll join us in person Sunday at 11 a.m. for worship.